Uh, and we're going to start by asking the question of why we should read the Bible. Why we should read the Bible. John chapter 5. If you want to stand with me uh, while I read these couple of verses here. Verses 39 and 40. You may recall, just a little background of this passage, that Jesus has, uh, has healed on the Sabbath, and that really, really bothered the religious leaders when he would heal when in their minds. In mind said he would, he would violate the Sabbath. And so he goes into this pretty, pretty uh, detailed teaching. And in the middle of it, he says something that, that chides the Pharisees, but it also helps us know something that we need to know. Look at verses 39 and 40. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you might have life. It's just a brief couple of verses, but it's significant because what? It's the inerrant infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord help us as we do this looking over the Bible to see Jesus in the Scripture more plainly. Thank you. Please be seated. There's a, there's a fancy word called epistemology, and it's just made up of, a, of, a, of epistle uh, communications uh, and and or study of, and it's really the study of, of how we know what we know. How do we know what we know? And if you think about that, there are two, from, from an earthbound perspective, there are two fundamental sources of human knowledge. There's reason and experience. And we need them to, to maneuver through the world about us, but they're, they're not enough. They're not enough for us to get down to ultimate questions such as, who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Is there any purpose to human existence? Where's history going? You see, reason and experience will not answer that. Experience is very short, uh, and reason is often tapped into sources that others have introduced to us. But the scripture comes along, God is kind, and he introduces a third source of knowledge, and it's called revelation. Now, when we talk about revelation, there's, there's two forms of it. So, you, so you, have, you have reason, experience, and revelation. There's two forms of revelation. There's general revelation, and then there's what would be called special revelation. Uh, just Let's look at a few verses of Scripture real quickly. Psalm 19, if you're familiar with this psalm, uh, 1 through 6, the 19th psalm is sort of a, an abbreviated version of the 119th psalm. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent. For the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. Notice the imagery, the powerful poetic imagery of, of, the, of the movement of the heavenly bodies. And like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens. Its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Now, hold on to that a minute and look at, look at Romans chapter 1, verse 20. And we know in Romans 1 where, where Paul is... Uh, as declaring in those opening verses, he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and the Gentile. He talked about how in the gospel of righteousness is revealed from faith to faith. But he also says that the wrath of God is a revelation. Not just the righteousness of God, but the wrath of God. And so he's arguing for the validity of God showing wrath, when he gets to chapter 1, verse 20, for his invisible attributes, I don't mean God there, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world 
and the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. This is a, these two passages, and many others like them, talk about general revelation. Again, Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. And what Paul tells in Romans 1, if you remember that passage, is that there's enough of God revealed in nature, these, these invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature. He goes on down to say that there's enough of God revealed in nature so that every human being, everyone made in the image of God, is without excuse when they do not encounter him in the person of his son. You see, there's enough of God revealed in nature to condemn every son of Adam and every daughter of Eve. However, there's not enough of God revealed in nature to save any one of them. It takes special revelation. That's why he says in verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their righteousness suppress the truth. Special revelation, however, uh, involves a more, a more direct means of communicating rather than his attributes displayed in the creation, in nature. And we know from the scriptures that, he, that these come to people in a variety of ways, in dreams and visions and angels, but the most clearly manifested revelation of God, Hebrews tells us, if you look at Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, the Hebrew writer uh, opening up his, it's a, really it's a sermon to, to Hebrew Christians, Christians of Jewish origin. Long ago, and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. General Revelation nature, creation, which reveals something of the reality of God. Special revelation, however, in his word, manifestly demonstrated in Jesus, uh, the without equal, the sunum bonum uh, of God's revelation to man. So why do we read the Bible? Because we will never know God the way that he has created us to know him apart from scripture. Well, there's a lot of corollaries to this. Why, do we, why, do we, uh, why are we so concerned about getting the, getting the scripture in the languages of the, of the people groups of the world? Because they will never know God apart from encountering him in his word and encountering him in and through the testimony of who Jesus Christ is and what he came to do. We read the scripture so that we may come to know God and that we may grow increasingly in the likeness of God manifested in Jesus Christ. And so when you look at our text, Jesus says something here that's very significant. He, he says to the Pharisees, to these, to these religious leaders, you search the scriptures. Now that's good. That's wise. Because you think that in them you have eternal life. They, they, they were feeding upon the, the Old Testament. They would memorize it. They, they would uh, nuance all of its verses. They would ask probing questions about the meaning of it. Because they wanted to be right with God. You think that in them you have, you, you can find eternal life. So all of that's a good thing. Unless... And it is they, the scriptures, and in this case, the Old Testament, that bear witness about me. If you search the scriptures, desiring to encounter God's ultimate revelation, God's one and only way to have eternal life, you would come to me. He says, yet you refuse to come to me that you might have life. You're looking in the scriptures to have life, yet the scriptures tell that I am the only way of life. What do we learn from this? A person can read the scriptures religiously, and if not reading them with what my friend uh, Joe Neeson calls gospel lenses, if not looking to see how Jesus Christ is revealed there, 
They can miss Christ. Miss Christ. Because that's exactly what the Pharisees did. You couldn't hold a candle to their, their devotion to and interest in the Old Testament. But they miss Christ. And so it seems to me that with that reality that we want to then learn, not, not, I don't think any of you here I would say would come to learn, but increasingly learn because you know. You know that Jesus, he's, he's the focal point. The Old Testament looks forward to his coming. The New Testament records for us his coming and, and, the, and, the, and, and the Gospels and the letters uh, look back to that. The, Acts is a, the book of Acts is a, is a testimony. It's the Acts of the Holy Spirit as witness to the person and work of Jesus Christ and, and his, his life manifested in the church. The book of the Revelation is, is about the future of his return. It takes in both, you remember I studied that, past, present, and future. But it's all about Jesus Christ. And to the extent that we make it about something else, we run the danger of missing Christ. If we make it about theology, we run the danger of missing Christ. If we do not recognize that theology is just Theos Logos, it's, it's, it's the word about God, and God has spoken most plainly in his Son. If we make it about prophecy or the second coming or, or tongues or just any, any number of things you could, you could make the Scripture about, but yet you don't look for Christ in that. Ask for help to see Jesus in that. You'll miss him. You see, the same book of Hebrews that begins talking about in these last days that he has spoken to us by his son comes to a conclusion. Look at, look at Hebrews 12. In Hebrews 12, verse 1, we're told that uh, we're to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and run with endurance. The race is set before us. Verse 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So how are we to live life? Looking unto Jesus. Well, where do we do that? You know, to hear some people talk, you would think it's just a mystical contemplation. No. We certainly, as we've talked about recently, need to cultivate the habit of silence and solitude, of meditating upon, upon the things of God and the person of God and the work of God. But that is a, that's, a, uh, that's a meaningless exercise if our meditation is not informed by the Word of God. We look unto Jesus by handling the Scripture, by reading the Scripture, and asking ourselves, what does this tell me about Jesus Christ? What does this tell me about, about my relationship to him? What does this tell me about how I should live in order to be increasingly conformed to the image of Jesus Christ? What does this tell me about what Jesus did? Who he was? What he accomplished? What he commands? We learn to ask the, the questions as we encounter the scripture. You see, the, the last book in the Bible, just as we looked this morning at the first book of the Bible, In the Beginning, God, the last book in the Bible, Revelation 22 and verse 13 Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Now you will remember from our study that Alpha is it's the equivalent. It's if, it's if I would say, I am the A and the Z. Alpha was the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega, the last letter in the Greek alphabet. I am the A and the Z. I am the beginning on the first letter and the last. And I'm every letter in between. And I'm, I'm the words that you form from those letters. I am, I am the source of knowledge, and real knowledge ultimately traces itself to me. That's what he's saying there. He claimed to be the key to the scriptures. Do you remember when the two uh, disciples were traveling on the road to Emmaus after the crucifixion and when, when there were the early rumors about, about the resurrection? They were, they were having a hard time believing it. Jesus just shows up on the roadside with these, with these disciples. Look at Luke 24, 44 to 46. 
He asked him, you know, early, why are you so sad? Are you, are you the only man that doesn't know what's happened, they said? So he said to them, verse 44, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me and the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Notice how Jesus identifies. And by the way, that would have been your three general categories. You'll, you'll read some things where there's two in the scripture, in the law and the prophets, everything written in the law and the prophets. And that's, that's kind of a summary for all of the Old Testament. Well, there was another way to look at the division of the Old Testament. The law, the prophets, and the Psalms, or the poetry. And so, so uh, in the law you had some history. In the prophets you had history. Uh, in the Psalms you had the, had the poetic uh, wisdom literature and of course the book of Psalms itself and it says then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures very instructive for us there the Bible is God's special revelation it's his story history is his story it is given to us by inspiration all scriptures God breathed we'll see that verse in a few minutes Theonoustos the breath of God, just as God breathed into the nostrils of, of Adam, our first parent, and he became a living soul, so God breathed out the words of these 66 books that are brought together in a collection that we call the Bible. That's inspiration, revelation. And what Jesus is doing here is he's taking the revelation that he had taught them, these things I taught to you, and he illumines them. There's illumination. Look. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. I don't know about you if you've had these occasions where, you know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily the first time you've read a passage, or it may be the first time you've encountered a passage, but you, but you come to a passage and, and light is brought to bear on that passage in such a way that you would say, I've never seen that before. You ever had that experience? I do. I do. That's illumination. Now the enemy of our souls would like to step in and say, well, how can you be so dull? You read over this and try to beat us down about it and make us feel badly. No, we need to learn to rejoice. What a precious, what a precious Lord and Savior we have. What a precious Holy Spirit that he would illumine to us. He wouldn't leave us dull and, and, and darkened to a truth or to a passage. He, he opens it up. So Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Where did he get that? From the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. My friend Ernie Reisinger, who's gone on to be with the Lord for several years now, used to say to us, Don't forget, guys, the New Testament church's manual of evangelism was the Old Testament. <laughs> they were writing the New Testament. It was the Old Testament. And so in these, in these, these 39 books, the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms, Jesus began to open them up and say basically what, you're, what, what this means is it was written that I would suffer. You're, you're, you're dismayed. You're, you're forlorn. You're downcast because, because you know that I was crucified. But it was, this was talked about in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. And not only that was it talked about that I would suffer, but it also talked about how on the third day would rise from the dead. Get, get the whole picture. Get the whole story. Now, I'm going to give you a term. And we're, going to, we're going to see the use of this as we go through these books of the Bible. Progressive revelation. Now, don't don't run away from because of the word progressive. The word progressive is, when you talk about political progressives, that's awful. That's horrible. I mean, you just, uh, that's basically code speak for, for doing away with that which is, has a long-standing tradition or a long-standing history of, of being right. That's not how progressive revelation is used. Progressive revelation is used this way. As you move through the Bible, I think I've given this analogy before, and it's, it's appropriate to give it again. If you and I went... Uh, into Carlsbad Caverns. Perhaps we had a church-wide 
uh, trip to Carlsbad Cavern. Or maybe go, go closer, one of these caverns up in Missouri. And we walked in there. When you go, if you've ever been in one of these caves, when you initially enter one that, does, that has no ambient light to it, no light uh, inside and no way to get light from outside, it is dark. It is, it is really dark. I think I've told you that Karen and I went uh, one time with some friends of ours on the back side of Pikes Peak to, a little, uh, to Cripple Creek, and there were some caves in there, and we went in some of those. And when you first step in there, I mean, you literally cannot see your hand touching your nose. You can't see it. But you know also, if you've been in one of these things, if you, if you stand around a while and look, that your eyes begin to adapt a little bit and you begin to take on shadows that you didn't see initially. You see the progressiveness of that? And I've, I've told you the analogy I've used is if you took a match and struck it, Light always drives back darkness. You would, you would see things that you did not see without the match. If you took that match and touched it to a torch, more light would push back more darkness and you would see more things. Now, when you see the shape of the room and the things in the room begin to, begin to come to light, and particularly in a cave, one of the things you see is stalactites, those things. And remember, the stalactites are the ones that hang tightly to the ceiling in the stalagmite is formed from the floor up. You would think me silly if I said, now, at what point since we've gotten in this cave did some folks bring these stalactites in here? I didn't see them when I first came in. No, no, no. You know that it's, it's a progressive revelation. Well, that's the way God unfolds his covenant. And one of the things you'll see in the book of Genesis is when he gives the covenant with Abram and then gives it again. He's, every time he gives it, there's more light being brought to bear. Progressive revelation. And when it's repeated to, to Isaac and to Jacob, and Joseph understands it. And then, and then you come to uh, Sinai and, the, and the, the Ten Commandments given as a covenant expression. When, as you see these things, he's, he's, drawing, he's pushing back darkness. He's progressively revealing so that even in the New Covenant, which is the ultimate covenantal expression in the Old Testament, these, these strong assertions, it's still not as clear as it can be until what? Until Jesus comes on the scene and he says what we've typically referenced in our, in our Lord's Supper celebrations. This is the New Covenant in me. Full revelation. So we're going, to, we're going to see some of that as we move through these, these various books of the Bible. The, uh, the 39 books of the Old Testament provide the foundation upon which the superstructure of the 27 books of the New Testament is built. And it's interesting, if you thought about this or not, but the scriptures claim to be completely divine. All scripture is God-breathed and completely human. Every book is written by a human being. None of them checked their personalities in at the door when they wrote. None of them became puppets. Only, only stroking, I'm going to do this in the, in the Hebrew form, only stroking as the Spirit moved their hand. But they were moved by the Spirit to write what they did. And so you have this, this interesting, we know that Jesus is the God-man, and God used a method of, of, of divine inspiration, taking human beings to write his story, his revelation. So the book that we call the Bible is completely divine. Its author is God, and yet written by humans, human agents part of the mystery. The process of inspiration was, was best described maybe by Peter. If you look over at 2 Peter 1, 21, when he's talking about Old Testament revelation, and he says, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. In other words, it did not originate with man. Uh, I don't know if you remember, I think it's Jesus Christ superstar, the, the rock opera telling the life of Jesus, there's a, there's a song in there where the apostles are singing. And they, they say, always knew that we would be apostles, knew that we could make it if we tried, 
Someday when we're old, we will write the Gospels, and they'll all talk about us when we've died. It wasn't that way. It wasn't that way. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Men spoke. Men from God. And God superintended their writing as they were carried along, borne along there by the Holy Spirit. And in the passage I referenced earlier, 2 Timothy 3.16, we know this, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable. I don't know if you've encountered a person like this, or maybe you've been influenced by this in your life, where someone says, well, I'm a New Testament Christian. And I understand what they're saying, that we don't, we don't adhere to the Old Testament ceremonial laws. We, uh, there's a reason we don't meet on the, on the seventh, seventh day of the week, though my Seventh Day Adventist friends give me a lot of grief about that. Um, I said, well, I'm a New Testament Christian. I'm a New Covenant Christian. But New Covenant Christians in the New Testament believed the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So let's just think for a few minutes about uh, this divine origin of the Bible that we're going to be looking at in the, in the months to come. It's a unique book. It's a collection of 66 books written over uh, a millennium and a half, 1,500 years, Authors from all walks of life, all levels of education. And it's unique. First of all, it's unique uh, in, its, in the way it was produced. There are books in this, in this Bible written by men who never met one another. They didn't live in the same time frame. Yet their story about God is the same. It's one book. In fact, the word Bible simply means, it's from the word Biblos, uh, which means book. It's called the Bible because it's a book. And yet within it are many books. When you were growing up, perhaps you had the same kind of training in vacation Bible school and other uh, teaching opportunities for children that I had, where we, we were taught to memorize the books of the Bible. How many of you know this? One? Let us sing the books of Moses, of Moses. You know that song? You that? Moses, let us sing the books of Moses, for he wrote the law. First Genesis, second Exodus, third is Leviticus, and the fourth is Deuteronomy. Anyway, Numbers, the, Deuteronomy, the last of them all. Now, referenced as books. They were called books. The book of Genesis. They each stand uh, on their own and have a message on their own, and yet they comprise one book. It's got historical narratives, it's got letters, it's got stories, it's got poetry. And yet, if, you, if you're familiar with it, if you have a good reading Bible reading plan. If you don't, by the way, this Read Scripture app that I mentioned it will, it will help you along the way and it gives you some great uh, video assistance. If you, if you have a good reading plan, you know uh, that it's a, it's a perfect unity. The story is the same. One fellow said, there's only three possibilities for the origin of the Bible. One, that it's authored by God. One that is authored by the devil, and one that is authored by men. When you examine them, we know neither the devil would not be this honest about himself in anything he had his imprint on. He would not tell the truth about himself. He loves to masquerade as an angel of light. He would never paint himself in the bad circumstances that this book does. Men are the same way. Men tend to want to write better of themselves than they are. And yet this book tells about the lives of men that are uh, pretty shocking, the things men do. So the only reasonable explanation is that God is the author. He's the author behind this. There is a unity of, of purpose and of story. 
It harmoniously traces redemption from Genesis to Revelation. There's not a place in the Bible where there's a different way to be saved proposed. Even when we're talking a lot about law, remember this, Exodus 20, which gives the Ten Commandments, verses 1 to 17, it is prefaced with, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Let me, let me give you a paraphrase. I am the Lord your God who rescued and redeemed and saved you. It's all about the grace of God shown to sinners in salvation. It's a self-consistent portrait that centers, when we learn to read it right, on the person and work of Jesus Christ as its primary theme. Over 1,500 years it was written, and century after century books were compiled. Look at what Peter said. I want you to look at 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12. He says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. Inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Talking about the prophets now. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. And the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, the things into which angels long to look, angels peer. That's the picture there. There's more than 40 authors who make up the authorship, the human authorship of the Bible. Think about just for a few of them, just a few of them here. Samuel, the judge. Amos, a sheep breeder. Ezra, a priest. Nehemiah, a statesman. There were scribes and kings and prophets and poets musicians and philosophers and farmers and teachers. The New Testament has among its writers a tax collector, a physician, a tent maker, two fishermen, two carpenters. Some were highly educated like Moses, Isaiah, Paul. Others were unschooled. It was written in three languages. Hebrew in the Old Testament predominantly. Greek in the New Testament predominantly, and then some Aramaic, which was the, the language that Jesus spoke. It was written on three continents. It contains prophecy, history, law, poetry, hymns, wisdom literature, stories, biography, letters, oratory, parables, philosophy, drama, exposition, sermons. It's, the production of it is unique. There's no other book in the history of the world like this book. Secondly, the Bible is unique in its, in its preservation. Think for a moment about how, about the efforts that have been underway for, for centuries to destroy this book. The Bible has survived virtually intact. One writer I, I read said this, it is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. We have no document, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, there is no document that has more manuscript evidence than the Bible. The philosophies of, of Plato, Aristotle, the great secular wisdom writers, their manuscript evidence is so scant that for someone to suggest that they will not take the Bible at its word, then they have to be intellectually honest and dismiss all of the writings of all of the great philosophers. Because we have more manuscript evidence for the Bible than all those others put together. People have sought to ban the Bible, destroy the Bible. It's the most popular book in the world. It's been translated into over 1,700 languages, portions of it have been. And I've told you this before. Every archaeological dig, and there have been many of them, every one, if, 
they find something of note, it simply validates. And I'll just remind you that when I was in seminary, there were some questions. Well, how do we know that who was the who was the king of Caesarea? How do we how do we know about this this Abraham? What what evidence do we have that he was a real person? And there was a place called Ebla in the Middle East. While I was in seminary, the news came that the Ebla dig had turned up something very fascinating. They found out they were digging in an area and they fell, in, as I understand it, fell into a room beneath where they were digging. And in this room were these ancient manuscripts. And they were, they were written in a language that required experts to come in and dust them off very carefully and begin to look at them. And they discovered they were in a library sort of a, an accounting library. And they kept reading about this, these transactions that were made with the people of Ebla by this fellow uh, Abraham of Ur. Well, that was, people were speculating, was there really even an Abraham? Was, was there an Ur of the Chaldees? Yes, there was. Ebla proved it beyond doubt. And that's the, that's the history of archaeology, by the way, biblical archaeology. It, every dig validates what you and I read and take for granted as true in the scriptures. It's been preserved. Third, the, the Bible's uh, proclamations are unique. Over a fourth of the Bible was prophetic at the time it was written. And the detail and the accuracy and the scope of these prophecies is, is fascinating. It covers the whole range from heaven to hell, from the divine to the demonic, from eternity past to eternity future. It paints for us God in a way that we would never have come to know him otherwise as the triune God. It tells us what man was originally in the garden. It tells us what happened and why he is presently the way he is. It's on the basis of the biblical testimony that, that Thomas Boston, one of the Puritans, wrote his work, Human Nature in Its Fourfold State. And as he studied the scriptures, he recognized that there was this, this first state, this original state of man as being upright, without sin, able to fellowship with God fully. But he talks about the second estate of men where he fell into sin and, and now he's incapable. He, he's been rendered uh, unable to fellowship with God. His sin is ever before God. He is doomed and damned to hell unless a rescue is undertaken for him. And that's when he talks about human nature in his third state. Man recovered, redeemed, something of Eden restored, where he now is able to fellowship with God, commune with God through Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit. And then he talks about human nature in its fourth state, where in heaven, that we will have everything Eden had and more. Because in Eden, it was all very tenuous. It was tied to man's obedience. In heaven, it will be tied to Christ's obedience. And there'll be no sin, no sorrow, no sadness, no sickness, no, no possibility, no temptation. And Boston learned this from studying what the scripture has to say about the nature of man. It's, it's, a, it's a book that's near. It's not a fable. You don't, you don't get the sense uh, like you do when you read some fairy tales long ago and far away. Even though when you read the book, you read history, you're reading the historical accounts of people who were there, eyewitnesses to them. Even the Revelation, which is eternity future, it's an eyewitness account by John. The final thing I want you to think about the uniqueness is what this Bible has produced. Not, not its production now, but what it has produced. No other book has influenced 
culture, thought, or the history of the world. If you go back and you know your history, you know that, that the Bible molded and dominated art, music, morality, oratory, law. It hasn't been that long ago that the greatest uh, English jurist, Blackstone, William Blackstone, who wrote his commentaries on the law, said in those in the 1800s that no law should be regarded as legitimate law if it does not line itself up with one or more of the Ten Commandments. That was the mindset. That's how the scriptures shaped philosophy, literature, Western civilization. History has been changed. We mark history before Christ, Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord, after the death and resurrection of Christ. It's changed millions of lives. There's no other way you can explain what happens coming out of Pentecost and going forward than the truthfulness of this book. Those men believed it. And multitudes have given their lives for it, and even today, multitudes still die for the sake of Christ because of the truth they find in this book. It's also provided hope and joy and, and purpose for all who embrace it and receive it and believe it is true. It reveals to us God's love. Have you thought about how God, even the false gods, are taught Islam, with all of its recitation of uh, there is but one God, Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Allah is an austere God. He is simply to be feared. They would never imagine being on the receiving end of the love of Allah. Buddha, the Hindu gods, the pantheon of gods, the animus gods, the, on and on and on. None of them speak of love like this love we know the love of God who so loved that he sent his only son it's unheard of in any of the lexicons that talk about deity the Bible tells us that we sang Jesus loves me Chris Tomlin's version of that Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so we would not know otherwise have no meaningful definition of it and it stands forever. And an army of the followers of the Lamb who are informed by this book march under its banner. You know, Isaiah 40, verse 8, the prophet Isaiah said that the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will, in, will stand forever. It has outlasted its critics. It has outlasted those who thought they would banish it from the earth. They have perished. The Bible continues. When the scripture is taken and breathed upon by the Spirit, and received by those who read it. Hebrews 4.12 says it's the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You know good and well if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. There have been times when you've been reading the scripture in private perhaps. Maybe it's been in a, in a Bible study class. Maybe in, in a worship service where the sermon's being preached and a, and a word of the Lord comes from this scripture and cuts you to the heart. How do you explain that? It is the power and the unique nature of this book. What we're going to do, Lord willing, in the, in the Sundays to come, we're going to take a look at an introduction, an overview, and then perhaps take a look at a brief outline of each book and then see, put on the gospel lenses and see how Jesus Christ is revealed. I want to just briefly uh, touch on the Old Testament before we close. Listen to Jesus about the Old Testament. Listen to, the, to, the, to words from the New Testament. One, one person said the Old and New Testament smoothly blend to create a bold sweep from eternity past to eternity future. The Puritans had a little couplet that I like. The new is in the old, concealed. 
The old is by the new revealed. They work together to bring to light God's truth. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 12, what we, what we call the golden rule, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Notice how he cites that, that body of material using the twofold division there. In Luke 16, 16, the law and prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. So, so the law and the prophets held sway to introduce the new covenant mediator, Jesus, bringing good news. Of course, that, that communication of the story Jesus tells in Luke 16, 29, when the rich man dies and begs Father Abraham to send Lazarus, the beggar who had died and was, was brought to the bosom of Abraham, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to warn my brothers. The answer in verse 29 is, Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Listen to them, they have the law and the prophets. They've been given revelation that will rescue them if they will, if they will hear it. And of course the man answers, no, no, Father, Abraham. <laughs> send back someone from the dead. They'll believe if Someone from the dead comes to them. Verse 31, he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And well, it was, that's so packed there. But that's the truth, folks. Some people are looking for something beyond Scripture to convince them of the reality of God. We've been given what we need the revelation. And we've been blessed on top of that with the New Testament revelation of Jesus. And then as I cited a while ago in Luke 24, 40, uh, 44, Jesus talked about uh, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. That's that threefold division. So law and prophets is, is, is uh, shorthand for the Old Testament. Law, prophets, and Psalms is another way of speaking shorthand about the Old Testament. Now, you probably know this, but the, but the Old Testament is divided Thirty-nine books are, are laid out in, in, our, in our English version. There were, there were 24 in the Hebrew Bible, and we haven't added to that. They just, they're, they're aligned and identified differently uh, in English translations. And it began when the, when, the, when the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, laid out the books this way. The law is five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, there, there are history books. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. The poetry books. The Psalms. Uh, Ecclesiastes. Song of Solomon. Job. These, these wonderful stories of wisdom literature. And then prophecy, the prophets. And you know, of course, they break up into the major prophets and the minor prophets. The major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel, and Daniel. The 12, um, the 12 minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, name. And so you have that, the, the prophetic structure there. When you combine the five books of the law uh, with, the, with the 12 historical books, you get, you get these 17 collections of history because the first five books of the Bible are a historical narrative as well. One last thing. I think I've got this on a, on a slide. When you think about uh, the law, it's historical. It speaks of the events that are past. It talks about God's work. It's in narrative fashion, and it references a covenant people. When you look at the, at, the, at the poetical works, it's not so much events, it's experience. Not so much about the past, but the present. It's not so much about God's work as it is God's ways. The format of it is a, is a poetic format. Not so much the covenant people, but the covenant practice. And then finally, the prophetic material. 
It's about expectation, not, uh, not so much events, not so much experience, but expectation. It's about the future. It's about God's will. It's about prophecy. It emphasizes these covenant preachers who proclaim the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord. This is the book we're going to embrace and by the Spirit I trust be taught, our minds be instructed, our hearts be warmed. I hope my prayer is when we get through with this a year or so from now that we'll have an enlarged appreciation for this book. See, I think one of the, and I'm, I'm guilty of this, some of the dangers sometimes is when we bore down into a verse or two and, and take it apart, which it's, it's certainly worthy of that and it's valuable for that, that we miss the big picture, that, that if we don't do the responsible flyover and see it from thousands of feet above, that we will miss the theme. We won't see its unity. We won't see its cohesiveness, its harmony. And there's a story here that God intended to tell. And may he help us hear the story. Before we close, I want to show you, uh, can we cue up that, that video? This is, this is uh, the Bible Project. This is sort of their introduction. And you're going to notice they're going to talk about these 16 chapters, they call them, but they're 16 movements of God. And I want you to hear them as we begin to get, get uh, used to them, and I hope you'll investigate this on your own uh, during the week. We got that? We know the Bible, Bible, Bible for many, for many people, people intimidated, intimidated books. But we but believe, we believe that the entire thing is one, one, one unified story that we believe that to be. And so we, so we want, want to help you learn, learn how to read the Bible as, as you actually read through the entire thing, thing, thing for yourself. So the reading so read scripture experience, experience is, first of all, first of all a reading plan that has broken, broken up the story. Bible into 16 chapters. Now, we've rearranged the order of some of the books to help you see how this overall story works and how each book contributes to it. So we begin with creation of the world and the fall of humanity, which leads to God's covenant promises to Abraham and his family, the people of Israel. Then you come to God's rescue of Israel in the exodus from Egypt, which is followed by the covenant God makes with them at Mount Sinai. From there, God leads Israel through the wilderness and then into the promised land, where Israel grows into a nation and breaks the covenant. And so this flows into the rise and the fall of Israel's kingdom, which ends with Israel being exiled from the land. Now, the story pauses right here, and you'll read through the poetry of the prophets who lived before Israel's exile, and also of the wisdom writings that reflect on this part of the story as well. After this, the story will pick up again, and you'll read the writings of the prophets who lived during the exile, then about the return of Israel from exile, and the writings of the prophets who lived after the exile. You'll conclude the Old Testament with the book of Chronicles. It's a summary of the story so far and how it all points forward to Jesus. And finally, we come to Jesus himself and his announcement of the kingdom of God, which is then followed by the letters of the apostles to the people of Jesus' kingdom. Finally, we'll conclude the entire biblical story with the revelation, a poetic vision of Jesus' return and the healing of all creation. Now, each of these 16 chapters has a number of reading sessions it will take to complete it. Some of these are shorter, others are longer. And if you take just 15 to 20 minutes a day to complete each session, you'll be able to read through the entire Bible in less than a year. Now, even with this map, many books of the Bible are really confusing. It's very easy to get lost. And so when you start each new book of the Bible, you'll be able to watch a short video that lays out that book's structure and flow of thought, and it'll give you tips about what kinds of things to look for as you read. But also, every book contributes to the overall story of the Bible as well. And so we'll have theme videos placed at strategic points in the reading plan to help you see how the part of the Bible you're reading at the moment fits into that larger story. Finally, each day's reading session includes a psalm because we believe that reading the Bible is not just an intellectual experience but also spiritual. And so we invite you to take the year to develop the daily habit of praying through the psalms. And by the end of the year, you'll have prayed through the whole book of psalms two and a half times. Our hope is that the Read Scripture experience will help you read through the entire Bible with greater understanding than you ever have before. So you can see for yourself the beauty and the wisdom of this ancient story that points us to Jesus. How their approach dovetails with what we're doing 
is simply going to bring you a visual assistant to see some things. I love the way these guys have sketched out uh, in summary fashion these books of the Bible. So we'll be drawing upon them as we go through the material that, that I'm preparing. Uh, sometimes they'll do this, sometimes they'll do this. But I think you're going to get a value from all of it. Before we close tonight, any questions or comments that you have? Uh, certainly in a setting like this where we're not, we're not rushed to run off to, to have lunch and get the afternoon going, I want to give that option. Not, it's not something that you're comfortable with.